so we're here to. <laughs> it's killing me. You know, it's like typically you want to say, "Oh, I'm Nikki." Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah that's that's gay. Um, you go. All right. All right. Welcome, y'all. You're about to see, for the first time ever, every video compiled on one badass disc on this DVD. That's the right. crew, full on, right now, right here. Over 20 years, we're gonna we're gonna walk you through it. We're gonna point out things you never knew were there. <laughs> and uh, things you probably wish weren't there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, hang on and uh, here we go. Enjoy and crank the fuck out of it. Yeah. Girls, 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 that's the name. I remember a conversation between me and Tommy real late one night. The album was called something and we had been out at a strip club and I called him and said you know I don't know why the title of the album doesn't sound right to me but this is what we do and we talked about girls 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 and we see it every day that's, that's those three neon yeah, words girls yeah. girls girls everywhere you go so you know you're designing an album cover and a tour and it doesn't feel right and you talk and you go what do we do we ride Harleys we play rock and roll and we go to strip bars and we drink. That's kind of all we do. We're really like, <laughs> there's, not, there's no depth here. Let's just yeah. lay it out on the table. Yeah. Destroy. Yeah. I got a fucking Now my is This isn't going to be a conceptual video. Yeah. This is real. This is the real deal. And, and, <laughs> and then going, well, let's just make a video like that. pretty simple except for one problem. MTV. MTV. Goes, well, that's your life, but it's not our life, and it's not our viewers' life. And when Tide wants to buy a 60-second Tide commercial, they don't like the idea of strippers. <laughs> so you're like, oh, okay, well, how do we get around this? You know, and I think that we started off by making the video extremely nasty. Everything is on the edge, and we sent it to them, knowing that when we shot the video, we had the... Um, mellower version in the can yeah so when they said no we said well okay you're, you're, you guys are right you know it's like being married you're right and then you you uh you give them the video and they went oh this is okay this is much better this guys. is much better is which up. which was our original vision yeah <laughs> same old situation Where do we shoot that? Alpine Valley? Live. Uh, yes. Yeah. Live. That was good live. That was great. The band had been on the road for about 10 months, and it just showed the band, you know, leaned out musically. We were so tight. We were really, we were like in our zone right there. On fire. Yeah, on fire. It was great. What I loved about that was when the, the drums went out over the crowd. Yeah, yeah. Which was really cool because you, if you when you see the video, you realize that we're not playing in an arena. We're playing in, we're playing a big outdoor venue, and so there's really, if you think about it, where where were the drums being hung from? It was pretty pretty and gnarly, pretty you know, outrageous. And it was rad. Was the clear camera ball? Remember that? That's right. It was, it was like a beach ball, but there was a camera in it. It was clear, and the crowd just passing it around. And some of the best shots yeah. are are just the rowdy like beach ball cam the, the shots. The balls just being passed out and the camera was just like it was that was, that was pretty, yeah. dope, pretty dope vince had the bungee cam mm -hmm. that thing was being stretched out all over the place and just let go and swung around the camera's going out over the audience getting these great shots i'm amazed we didn't get sued for that <laughs> <laughs> yeah wayne isham came out and just basically captured it like you, we gotta give props to wayne on just how to set up some really interesting camera usages instead of the Here's the guy on the tripod, here's the live guy, here's yeah. the very un untraditional way of doing shooting video. Well, the, the original concept behind the background singers was there's only so much you can do um, live, you know, when you're four guys. Yeah. 
and so we decided to kind of take like the Rolling Stones approach or some of the classic bands that we grew up with that had actual background singers and we used them as part of the show, you know, we yeah. dressed them up like strippers and made them look hot. Made them look hot. You can only really watch four guys for so long yeah. if you're a male fan, so it's yeah. a little extra eye candy we thought it was a good, that was a good move. I would have yeah. appreciated that if I went to see somebody and they had no the girls up there. <laughs> Outside, uh, we started using some computers yeah. around that time. It was kind of a song that, you know, so Nikki and I started working on, and it just turned into this big, almost machine. Go, 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 go. And it was like, whoa, this is heavy. As far as the video goes, I think the fact that Wayne left all the camera people in it just showed how crazy it was to make it. Bombs are going off, drums are spinning around upside down, Nikki's rolling down the stage. I mean, it was just, it was insane. It was real. Most videos, you don't see all the stuff going on. Yeah. And that's, that's what was the intention, is just to let people see what's really going on. Wayne just didn't miss anything. It's like, okay, strap a camera to it. Strap a camera to him. Stra you know, just like whatever, whoever's moving, something needs to have a camera on That's him. Right. <laughs> and I remember going like, dudes, I dreamt, I dreamt of playing drums upside down. Like, and they're like, whoa, that's crazy. And, and it just goes to show how we hate the word no. We, yeah. we must have went to three or four different huge set, set companies to build it, and they're like, can't be done. We're like, can't? No? And what are those words? That's yeah. insane. It's not uncommon for us to say things like, wouldn't it be great if the drums like flew over the audience? <laughs> and everybody would like... They look at us like we're on crack. We're on crack. We finally found some guy who's a hydraulic specialist uh, on a Navy submarine and had all the knowledge of how to put this together. As the tour went on, you know, started incorporating, uh, getting the crowd involved, you know, asking them if they wanted to see the drums go right, and boom, the drums go right, and we're playing like this, and left, and we got, you know, asking the crowd, you want to see, you know, see, see us spin this fucker around, they're like, ah, and you're like, boom, and they're like, ah. I, was <laughs> remember, I will never forget, oh, and that thing also went right to the front of the stage, so yeah. I, I'll never forget seeing kids' eyes just like this, like, are you fucking kidding me? This is insane. Because I remember the next tour, you going, well, I went to the audience, but now I want to go in the audience. Yeah. And, and everyone's like, can't be done. Can't be done. And we're like, okay, here we go again. <laughs> right, here we go again, the battle. <laughs> Our thing was, how can the guy in the, the shittiest seat, we call it the Stevie Wonder section, because you can't see shit from back there. Binoculars, uh, look, look <laughs> rad, you know, they're this big on stage. In the very back of the arena, have a front row ticket. How do we make that happen? And yeah. when the, the drums are sitting out there, and these guys are in the very, very back, and they're just like, yeah. It's amazing That's when sick. the drum solo is going on, and you look out, and you see the whole front of the arena turn around backwards. Yeah because he's now out there. Yeah. Now, the guy in the front row has the Stevie Wonder seat. Yeah, the guy in the front row's got the bad <laughs> ticket. And it was like, okay, now how do we get down? And it was like, let's, we would uh, jump and rappel down this rope right into the crowd, just like Because at that time, we had like dressing rooms under the stage. So we'd be going, here Tommy's going off, crowd's going crazy. And all of a sudden, you hear this dead silence. And I looked at Vince, and I was like, oh, that's not good. <laughs> and we yeah, go out and that, went out there, and Tommy had come down the rope and missed yeah. and gone all the way down. Hit the floor. Hit the floor. He was out cold. Unconscious. Boom. Talk, on about, a, talk about a weird feeling. There's all this energy. Everything's positive, and all of a sudden, it's just dead. Yeah. And, and you know, we didn't know if he was, was dead or not. And, and he's such a hardhead. 
he gets back up on the stage and goes, okay, let's go. And everyone's like, no, you're going to the hospital, bro. You landed on your head from 70 feet. <laughs> the show must go on. <laughs> Say live wire in a sentence. Uh, uh, hi, I'm saying live wire in a sentence. <laughs> Dude, we're starting to go back now, bro. Help me out. Yeah. Oh, man, I'm telling you. I don't know. I just remember that that was our first time of ever making a video. In the beginning, we didn't know that there was charts. And we thought a record company was like, man, if you're on a record label, that's like, you made it. We just followed our heart. And that's what I remember about the band so much in those days. And that video, I mean, it's really hard to remember back that far, but we just kind of played live. We just rocked the shit. I'm a young, run free, a little bit better than it used to be, cause I'm alive. We were 100% committed to it. And I think that you see that in the live wire video, which is us being raw and as much energy and as much whatever we can get captured on film. You know, there wasn't MTV at the time. The first time I ever saw Live Wire was I saw it on, on uh, HBO. Yeah, and some H cable show. Yeah, some cable thing. show had just come out, HBO, and, and uh, they had like a little rock section. <laughs> Looks at Kill is built to shock. And MTV was brand new. So we said, well, wait a minute. Every, we've got everyone's attention for three minutes. What can we do to like, make them feel uncomfortable? What I seem to remember is one of the fun, funnest, funniest moments of the video. I mean, it was fun making it, of course, always. But one of the things that sticks out as a, a, a highlight was us in full-blown makeup lipstick, leathers, you, you name it, full motley regalia. And some light grip or sound, or I don't know, some dude goes, you know, we overhear him saying like, these guys look like fags. And I'll never forget, Nikki fucking looks over, looks down at him, and he goes, look, just because we're wearing fucking lipstick doesn't mean I can't come down and kick your fucking ass. <laughs> just because I'm wearing lipstick doesn't mean I can't, I can't kick, kick your, your ass, ass dude. dude. And we were right. <laughs> And I think we had him removed. He went on to be Wayne Isham. Oh. changed our, our whole look and our sound right after um, Shout at the Devil. And this is, this is a cover song, a song that we grew up listening to all the time at Brownsville Station. And uh, yeah, I think it was a stretch. It was really a stretch to go out there. We were making what I guess you would say is a real kind of concept video, you know, first time for us really pushing that envelope of being commercial. Bend. Over. I, I mean, this did so well for us. It was really, really, really did well for us. I don't really yeah, know that what was I, played a lot, a lot to death. Die. It was, it was a, it was an interesting video because it was a, kind of a little bit of an insane, an insane look to it. <laughs> it was shot in a high school in 
Covina like somewhere. Like Altenburg, yeah. you know, where we kind of grew up. Yeah, or Glendora, I, I can't remember where. All I remember was we shot that in the summertime and it was fucking hot. And we had a little kiddie pool uh, out back filled with some water to cool down. We had some girls in there, so yeah, I can't yeah. remember. You're just never able to see our side of things, are you? Yeah. Strange cat, huh? Yeah. Huh? What was the dude's name? Oh, Michael. Michael Berryman? Berryman. Yeah, yeah Michael Berryman. Michael he was Berryman. in the eyes, the hills have eyes, and all that classic old yeah. stuff. And it, as only with Mick Mars, him and Mick became like best best friends. You can see these two guys together. It's yeah. like cousin it and this thing. I know. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> They're amazing. Remember he could make his ears wiggle? <clears throat> yeah. And we were just like, that's crazy. We got to shoot this. And then we yeah. made it in the. <laughs> he could do all kinds of fun stuff. He almost joined the band. <laughs> My favorite video is absolutely Home Sweet Home. I'm on the way. I'm on the way. Home Sweet Home. Tonight, tonight. Home Sweet Home was a pretty interesting song for us at the time, if you think about it, because we just got done doing Shout at the Devil. So people were like, what the fuck are you <laughs> thinking? If you, if you really look at it like that, I mean, I remember a lot of people going like, Whoa. shot at the devil, looks a kill, bastard, knock him dead, kid, home sweet home. It showed the fans what our life is like out there. You know, the, the, the we, how we travel and what goes into putting the stage together and the camaraderie of being kind of just the guys together on the road going from city to city. Home, sweet home. Girls pulling their tops up, us traveling around. It's definitely showed us still doing our thing, but yeah. just in a different light. It's not really sad to go out there and do that. No, it doesn't suck. We had a lot of fun as a band, you know, and I think that we always wanted to let people see that. If you remember correctly, yeah. There was that cheap little piano in the corner. I mean, a little like keyboard, and yes. and and we'd been practicing the song, and you'd been playing it on grand piano. Yes. In rehearsals, and yeah. we we had a vision. This was like our dream on, you know, our stairway to heaven. Okay. So it was very important. The piano part that Tommy had was a very important part of the song. It, the whole song's based on that. And Tom Mormon's like, you know, being a producer, you know, we'll just use this little Roland in the corner. I remember. We, we were like, dude, I don't think so. But you know, <laughs> sometimes people can be very convincing. So when the, it was said and done for years later, we would always look at each other and go, why didn't we record that with a real piano? Yeah. So when it came time to do, uh, it was Decade of Decadence, we wanted to put that song on the Decade of Decadence um, album. Tommy said, you know, I'm going to re-record this now. Yeah, let's up update the sound. Yeah, let's update the sound or get it to where the original vision was. And so that kind of kicked off wanting to do a new video as well. Just one more night and I'm coming on this long winding road. I'm on the way. I'm on the way. Oh, sweet. Us, because we're so colorful and dark at the same time against white, was just this positive and negative um, imagery of us. The way we look against white is just once again going against the grain. You wouldn't really see us doing something like that. And we wanted to add some more shots of, uh, of real people, like some, some you know homeless people, some surfers. Some, we just wanted to bring in some more of, uh, of uh, more, just more culture into the song as well. The song. For us, was about the road. Yeah, and it was about our life and our lifestyle and our camaraderie and being a, a gang. But at that time, that song wasn't our song anymore. It was people's song. And it showed. I, I think that the cool thing that it showed is it showed other people's favorite place, their home, sweet home. The guy, the, the surf guy, there. You know, five in the morning. Just, this is what he does every day. This he lives to catch that wave. 
guy driving his truck. That's his home. He probably spends more time in his truck driving across the country than he does at his home. Showing other people in their home, you know, and sort of bringing that in with what we were doing. Yeah. Too young to fall in love. This director was pretty outrageous at the time. Yeah. I remember that I think Tommy had called me up and said, Hey, I saw this clip from this this director that's, that's out, He's there. out there, dude. We want to do something really something with this guy. And so we were like, okay. And uh, we flew to New York and we were in an abandoned train station for three days, and uh, that's the, the whole video was shot down there. And we were starting to, you know, kind of get the concept of you could spend two, three, four hundred thousand dollars and, you know, this, it was totally opposite than what we started out with Livewire, where we were just a band. I mean, there was, there was acting, and there was scripts, and fighting. there was fighting, and costuming, and, and um, you know, it was pretty outrageous, you know, for, for the time. I remember feeling pretty proud of that video. Well, no, it's not a true story. We learn to lie. This is like really demented. At the time, I had been dating this girl, and uh, I found out she was cheating on me with this other guy. <laughs> You're dead. Well, this other guy happened to be this guy in a band, uh, not in a band, he's in General Hospital, and he had a hit called You're All I Need. So I wrote the lyrics, You're All I Need, but based it on killing your girlfriend and gave it to my girlfriend. <laughs> to fuck with her head, and then everyone's like, wow, that's pretty cool, dude. <laughs> that's very motley. <laughs> I remember Doc McGee telling me that John Bon Jovi said, wow, they just wrote like the best pop song I've ever heard. And then Doc said to John, he says, have you listened to the lyrics? <laughs> and then he said, well, no, no, I just, you're all I need, right? And he says, no, 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 go, go back and listen, <laughs> listen to the verses, dude. <laughs> listen to the verses. <laughs> So it ended, up, it ended up staying on the record, and then we ended up making the video for it. We based it on a Taxi Driver, with uh, him sitting there burning the pictures of his girlfriend after he had already killed her. And yeah, and also more problems. I remember, up oh, can't have the body bag, or that's right, or, or you could just show it zipping up, or so, it's just it was more, a more lot like, of drama. We're always pushing it, you know, with more stuff and. You know, it's more things got cut out as you. And I remember yeah. hearing, how can you release a video without your band in it? We we're like, well, the song's not about the band. It's, it's yeah. a story. It's a story. And it's based on this movie, based on a kind of a concept of had enough of this girl and you're gonna kill her. <laughs> Start my fart. Oh my god! Who farted? Woo! I have a great story about Kickstart My Heart. Um, I went skydiving for my birthday, right? And uh, and before you leave, uh, there's a list of songs no on, way. on the wall. And yeah. skydiving naked from Yeah. Me. Kickstart my heart, and a few other songs are at that on that list of, for the videotape that yeah. they give you after your jump. I was like, yeah, put that on it. Nice, dude, it was awesome. Nice, fucking awesome. Kickstart my heart conceptually 
came from the fact that the band had been, you know, is adrenaline junkies. And we'd been using everything in the world from girls, cars, drugs, rock and roll for adrenaline. Nike, Nike, and when it stopped working for us, we decided to, all together as a band, you know, as a gang, say, you know, we're not going to do any drugs anymore. So what do you do? Fuck. No, man. You gotta like, kick it up a notch to, to still get high. Yeah. And that's kind of what the album you know, had in common. That's what the song was about. And, and it, it really is about adrenaline. I remember bringing that into rehearsal and thinking that the song didn't have a hope in hell. Like it was just so punk rock. As soon as Tommy started playing that beat, and Mick started playing the guitar. It instantly sounded like Motley Crue. As the song was coming together, I remember thinking, this is kind of like Ballroom Blitz by the sweep. Yeah. Do -do 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 -do. Right. And it was like, okay, you know, this kind of a feel um, is might be perfect for this. And I remember that as it all came together, that, it was that like, was, oh, that, that was your thing with the drums yeah. immediately. And doing the video at the Whiskey was kind of like a homecoming for us. Get back home, sweet home. Yeah. yeah, this is where it all began. The problem with being uh, in a band sometimes is that you become more than the band. You become more than the four guys in a rehearsal room. It, it becomes this, this big thing and we were so huge as a band. It was about arenas and stadiums and so for us to go back to the Whiskey A Go Go and play in this 200 seat club. <laughs> that was insane. That was insanity. We didn't know how to do anything. Small. Small. So we, we actually <laughs> the had too a, much guys. The too much guys had a <laughs> semi truck full of sound equipment in the whiskey. People in there were just like, this is insane. This is the doctor. I remember, I remember in coming into rehearsal and Mick started playing this doog 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 and I instantly said the words, he's the one that got Dr. Feelgood, and it was like it just kind of meshed right then and then we started playing the verse thing and Tommy came up with the, the heavy He's always good for coming up with the rhythm and the, you know, the part that really gets you moving, you know. And, we just, and that song really came together it did. really fast. <laughs> Now that song actually, um, I think this is an, an alternate set of lyrics to that, because we demoed that up. Oh, um, that's right. So the, the, we had actually, when we got up to Vancouver to record the album, Bob Rock took me aside and said, I think you can do better. Fucking suck my fucking dick. <laughs> Which I'm really glad that he pushed, pushed me to do that, because then it kind of came around to that song representing the artwork and the artwork and the tour and, you know what I mean? It all kind of fell into place then. And the, the concept behind things like, you know, um, kickstart my heart and stuff like that. So it really, um, that, that was really a, probably a big turning point for us. Yeah, that was a fun video to make too. The yeah. whole like Tony Montana, Scarface kind of a thing and us, you know, in the middle of nowhere. Who the hell were we when we shot that? The, the middle of nowhere. nowhere <laughs> this tent and just to, to, to light the drums on fire and just kick them. These guys are breaking everything in sight. Like yeah. that was like, for us, that was like, you know, we were all sober then, so lighting shit on fire and smashing everything, we, it, we were high. That's, yeah. we, were, we were definitely just like, yeah. Yeah, in a nutshell, oh, that's it, right? Yeah, Wayne Isham again. Yeah. Yeah, Wayne's got his, as many balls as we do, so that's what made yeah. it fun. We're like, you know what, we're shooting it, let's just do it. And we got shot down a lot after. You know, you but you know, MTV and that's got to come out. That's got to come yeah, out. Yeah, that's out, 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 but out. We shot out. it. Yeah. What the hell? You know, and, and, and th there's a in the Doctor Feelgood video. There's a, there's a great scene where it shows Sunset Strip tattoo shop, and we were I don't know what we were doing, what the point was, but one of us had stuck a sign in the window that said "No fags." 
And, and to us, fags means like no no boneheads, no wimps. It's nothing sexually. It's more like just like a, a guy saying, you know. Yeah. And um, we never thought anything about it until MTV came back to us and said, "Wait a minute, <laughs> you can't do that." So they actually took Wayne had to take each scene or each still, right? Yeah. And had to hand paint in the F into a B. So if you look in, it says in the window, it says no bags. Yeah. So I thought I think that's a pretty cool little <laughs> bit of history for, for fans to know. Don't go away mad. Just go away. And that was a, a song that is basically our way of uh, getting in under the radar with a, a song that was a really great written song, uh, but with the the, sub, the title of "Girl, Don't Go Away, Mad," just go away, just basically just piss off. And it was it was like our way of writing a really cool song, but still having some snot attached to it. Of course, yeah, of course, a little bit. Suck it. That's yeah. the one where he, he was in New York. That's right. In a lot of plane. Yeah, and we were. That's in right. LA and the skateboarders on the street. That's right. That's right. Okay, it's all coming back. I remember Duff had called me up and gone, because we'd, we'd gotten off drugs about that time, and he'd said, <laughs> "That's some fucking weird shit, man. Shaving the side of your heads like that, because we'd shaved off, shaved yeah. over that." Yeah. He's like, "That's some weird sober shit, man. You guys all right? You guys all right?" <laughs> <laughs> Just the video to me was was. Uh, was pretty fun, you know. It, it, again, we had talked at different times here about the rawness. That performance piece was shot in a little tiny stage, just the band being the band. That's how I think of Motley Crue. I, when I think of, uh, you know, what it's like to be in a band, I don't think about stadiums and I don't think about a, arenas and I don't think about jets. And I think about, you know, a Marshall stack, drums set up on the floor bunch of ashtrays, some pizza boxes, and just fucking cranking out metal. That's that's what rock and roll is. So when you capture that, like in the rehearsal scene in um, Don't Go Away Mad, you know, yeah. and the band being the band interacting with each other, you're getting a pretty pretty clear vision of, of what it's like, you know, to, for us. This is third video, <laughs> fifth album, called Without You. Check it. Without you, there's no change. And nights and days are gray. If I reached out and touched the way, it just would have been the same. There's a sound of a surrealistic look to that video, which I liked. And I think it was a bit cutting edge at the time. There were some bands out that were new wave bands at the time, and Tears for Fears, and bands like that. And they were doing some pretty interesting videos, and I think this is more in that that vein, but in our musical style. Didn't that didn't that Tiger? Was there a problem with that thing? Uh, was it something? We took it to the beach. We went yeah, we, on the beach with this big giant leopard, yeah. and I will never forget this thing wrapping its paw around my leg. In, yeah. a, in a playful way, but feeling the force of that. Yeah. It's so much power, you know. Yeah, that if it wasn't playful, it would be ugly. Yeah. yeah. Czar. Czar. How do you remember that? It just came to me right now. Czar was the, the, the tiger's name. It was. Czar. Just came back. I have no idea from where. Sometimes I think my fucking brain cells are fried, and then these amazing the like moment. recollections come back, and I go, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm all right. I can remember okay. that tiger's name. I'm all right. I can do more. Yeah. <laughs> When you're pissed off and, and sick of people telling you what to do, you primal scream. Get that I really believe at that time we were reinventing the band. Yeah. That's one of my favorite songs by the band. 
Yeah. So emotionally. That's it, a good one live, too. Emotionally, it touches you, what it means lyrically. And it's got the chant to it, so you can get into it. I like that stuff. It's, just, it's shot so amazing. And I just thought, like, yeah. I especially thought Vince looked amazing in that. And every singer's supposed to look amazing in, in it, you know? And he just looked great there. The whole band looked really good. Shot well, shot dark, it was heavy. There was some mystery to it. Music that, that, that turns me on has to either scare me a little bit or be mysterious. If it's just sort of like, mm, doesn't really have a vibe to it. This had yeah. a dark, whoa, you wanted to you wanted to see more, you, you know what I mean? You couldn't really see everything, and when you can't see everything, there's that unknown. Trigger, there, triggers dark. your imagination. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, if you don't tell the whole story, the, your imagination can fill in the blanks. Yeah. I think that's the, the case in point there. Yeah. None of the girls in the, or the people in the video um, had clothes on at all, because it was primal, the concept of just being back to, back to nothing. Yeah. And um, the way that Matt lit it was with a, um, there's a stick yeah. and a light bulb. That yeah. was it. And it was amazing. These people would be crouched down in like a corner and you'd have this light bulb over them and you'd be filming it. You would you know? only light them as the light went by, you know, just done really cool technique. And I also remember one more of the fun parts of shooting yeah, the video. I, I know you do. Was when, once we got done doing our performance <laughs> part is when Matt shot all the, the beautiful women and the bodies and stuff. So he's like, hey guys, I'm shooting the girls next. We're like, right on, we're coming. <laughs> and, we, and they're watching and they're you know, all wet and just, just he would just shoot their, their back, you know, on the top of their, their ass and the side of their breasts. And it was just strictly professional. It's beautiful. <laughs> I think I have something in my eye. <laughs> Enslaved was a song, there was two songs off of the Greatest Hits record. Yeah, one was called Bitter Pill and the other one was called Enslaved. One was a song that I had actually written and, and mostly and another one was a song that Tommy had mostly written. Yeah. So there was these two songs and they had these like really different feels and, and everything to them and the, the, the lyrics are very, you know, about being, about being free, being jailed and so to speak it was the time when you were in, in prison. And, I think that what we had ended up doing was we, we allowed the fans to videotape the, the shows and then we took all their bootlegs and cut them together. It was a weird thing because like I was saying, there was two songs and we wanted to give these two songs both a forum. So we were trying to figure out different ways to do it and, and by taking all of this existing footage of the band, playing this song Enslaved Live. and cutting it all together it was kind of a gorilla again wow because it wasn't it. really there wasn't a vehicle at the time for for a band like motley crew because mtv had gone from being a music channel to being sort of a different kind of a network and it was all about top 40 and we're not a top 40 band and so here you have this band who wants to kind of very much like we did livewire just do something because we love it we love the song we love performing the song we wanted to have a video of it it's for the fans. See, I've never seen this one. You never have? No, I've never seen it. It was out on the road with us. I think you have, but you know, it might just be that little part of your brain that, like, you know. The, yeah, yeah. Little void. Little void. I got him. I swear it's true. You can't fuck a punk song I up. I went, oh. It's impossible. Anarchy, you know, I don't think people realized how much of a punk band Motley Crue really was. And that our influences, I mean, we would sit around and listen to the Misfits and the Pistols and then ACDC and Judas Priest. We were a very unique bunch of people and we had this guitar player that listened to the blues and, and we just piled it all in a blender and turned it into this band. So throughout time, you know, we could do without you and then we could do Anarchy in the UK. For 
were like, you can't do that. But I think that's why we did it. One of what I remember about that video was that we wanted to, we wanted Primal Scream to be the single off of Decade of Decadence. And we wanted Anarchy in the UK to be the single off of Decade of Decadence. And MTV said, well, you, you know, that's nice guys be, you know, one single, one network. And we said, no, no, two singles, one network. And they said, it doesn't work like that. And we said, yeah, it does. And we, we shot our live performance playing with, uh, we're playing Monsters of Rock yeah. festivals in, in uh, Europe. Europe. And we went back to MTV and we said, we want this one to play at night. And we want this one to play in the daytime. And they thought we were insane, but we were in such a power position that we could say, if you don't do this, we're not going to give you either. And we did that, and it was the first time in history a band ever had two videos simultaneously released as singles on a network. And it was amazing, because Headbangers Ball was all about heavy metal and anarchy in the mm -hmm. UK and all that stuff. And then our daytime uh, rotations were Primal Scream, the song mm -hmm. that was at radio. And, and it was amazing. It was, it was really exciting for us to find just another way to beat the system. And I can't. Hooligan's Holiday, it's the first one with John Karabi. Yeah, first one. It's fucking amazing. Great video. You met the, uh, who's the English cat? Can't remember his name. I wish Fuck, I could I find him because he's so talented. Me. Yeah, great guy. That was a fun video to shoot. Well, we kind of, the whole premise was Clockwork Orange, wasn't it? Yeah, totally Clockwork Orange. The director had a very, kind of that, that Clockwork Orange, British, snotty, yeah. you know, outlook on things. One of my favorite shots is the intro, and Karabi singing, drop dead beauty, with the, the just the mouth unzipped in this bond right. bondage mask, just his lips singing yes. it. Drop dead beauty is stomping up a storm, lines of hell on a face. We were Teddy Boys. Remember That's the, right. Remember the crazy dude up rigs. And we were up for anything, yeah, right? Yeah, we were like, let's do he it. He was dude. like, look, I want to put you two guys in his Teddy Boys with switchblades hanging out in an alleyway. We are like, all right. Right on. <laughs> it was the, the first time that we had ventured out without Vince in the band, and I think that was, uh, we, you know, we had a lot to prove. Yeah. Like, any anytime somebody leaves the the mothership, you know, you're like, man, this is really important to me. Yeah. Because we really want people to know how serious we are about this. Yeah, and it was a new energy, you know? Mm -hmm. was some there's a, a new a new element into a band that's been doing this already for so long, and there's this new new energy, new vibe, and we were like, okay, let's make some crazy new shit. That video was just shot badass. Love the way that came out. song sort of dictates, at least in the intro, is the, just, you know, the chord progression is just mellow. We're, we're sitting out on the front porch, Mick's playing acoustic guitar, you're, you're playing an acoustic bass, I remember. Mm, I, so. uh, cool. I was playing just one drum, uh, I think it's just with the mallet, like, because it's, it's just mellow. It's just mm -hmm. a really mellow thing, the camera pulls back and Karabi, was he on the roof or on the, I can't or remember. just sitting on, sitting on the porch? It's very much what the music was sort of uh, dictating, and then as the song gets, uh, the song progresses on. Um, you see that lady, the, the little old lady, starting to just eat all these pills, and it's just all oh, distorted. Right, yeah. Remember? Yeah. And then, and, and then it's the band performing in a, an area, you know, like no bigger than this. We were all smashed into a corner, which was perfect. I, I remember that being really uncomfortable, and that's me and Tommy went, "That's where it should be then." Yeah. Because. We're used to being on these huge stages, so let's put the band in a place they're uncomfortable. And if you're uncomfortable, you usually do something different, yeah. and it's going to come off on film. Mm -hmm. And that, that video, like I think, like you were saying, it, it really the lyrics told the story, and the the video just followed the lyrics. Yeah, absolutely, the atmosphere was was the this video part. At the end when the old guy, you just see his bed. He's just not there anymore. Yeah. That's just yeah. like, whoa. <laughs> Thank you.
Smoke the sky. That was done guerrilla style. We did that at rehearsal, right? That's right, in a rehearsal room. One camera, Yeah. bang, one hour, shot it, done. You know, we put out a, uh, an album that we believed in 100%, and it definitely wasn't fitting into any niche. And we did the first video, Hooligan's Holiday, and then we did this song, Misunderstood. And then um, record company was like, well, you know, uh, this album's over. And we're like, no, it's over when we say it's over. And we still have more to say. Can I say this? Don't no! say that, you guys! Dude, are we done yet? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so we wanted to do this gorilla style, as Tommy says, video, because we wanted to show that side of the band. And we actually funded it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing because I look back and I go, man, some of our videos, Live Wire, Primal Scream, Smoke the Sky, those are the fucking ones that I'm the proudest of, and those are the ones that we just just shot raw. And I remember, okay, dude, did I did I throw up or did I cough or something? I remember oh, we we taken a break, you know, we had something to eat, I think we had small lunch or something, and you're playing and this song, Smoke This Guy is fast as hell, and we're giving it everything we got, we're shooting. And I think I like like hiccuped or coughed. And like a piece of corn shot out. <laughs> and if you look closely, I think there's a shot where I'm hitting the cymbal and you see this little yeah, chunk. Yeah, that's right. Little chunk of throw up or corn or whatever the fuck it was, go tink. So slow it down right around slow there. Down, yeah. <laughs> Don't be eating dinner. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful concept. That was a great concept. And another woman, yeah. director. Are you sure it was a woman director? Yeah, I do remember, and I'll tell you why I remember, because it was very ego deflating for me to be standing there inside this cage, which was the underside of her dress, and she says, you know, if I would have known that Nikki Six would be a fucking pussy, I wouldn't have done this video. I'll never forget that, because what was happening in the video was they were rocking the the the, dre the skirt was a stage. Yeah, it was a and stage we, that was fucking moving violently. Violently, and and me and Mick were trying to stand our ground, and she got pissed because the idea was for us to flail, to fall, to crash, burn, get hurt, and we were trying, you know. And I was like, whoa, what the fuck does that mean? And then she told me, and I was like, oh. And then we kind of stopped fighting the process, and that's the, the anarchy of that video. I mean, I was sitting down on a drum stool, still having a real hard time playing the song and staying on the drum. But these guys are standing up, and they're just getting freaking tossed into this wire, these, you know, this metal cage, and they're getting pretty beat up. And I'm sure uh, if we were fortunate enough to have some of the outtakes, you'd see these guys went down a few times. Yeah. It's, it was extremely there, difficult there was to film. There some humiliating stuff, which, yeah. was, which was good. You know, I understood what, understood what she was trying to get, because when I see the video, I'm like, look at that, man. It's, if you could imagine a, a band being able to have that kind of energy in a stage live. <laughs> it looks like all hell all was breaking loose. All hell's breaking loose. The one cohesive thing throughout the video was Larry Flint. Well, I'd, I'd called him up, and you know, somehow I always get put up to being the, the guy in the band that has to do this. <laughs> and they're like, who's going to ask Larry if he wants to be in a video? And the concept is that like he's carving legs. He's making they're like, this doll. They're yeah. like, Mickey will do it. They're like, god damn it. So I'm <laughs> talking to him and saying, so Larry, what's going on? And blah, blah, blah. And this is the concept of the video, you know, like, you're, you're crippled and you don't have any, I'm fucking totally falling over my words. And he's like, I love it. I love it. I love it. He's just amazing. He's very Motley Crue. <laughs> the song was great. It was, uh, it was us. It was a new record. Vince was back. Uh, oh, and we had worked with um, a new producer at the time, with Scott Humphrey. And just brought some new, new, new sound elements, new, uh, new fresh kind of a vibe for us. Yeah. 
that song's one of my favorite songs off that record. I think very much like um, Wild Side, we, we were trying to push our own envelope sonically, and that's what we were trying to do, you know, I don't know how many years later. That was 87, and then we were 97, 10 years later. Still trying to push our own envelope. The, the, the thing is, you know, historically, I know fans know this, um, but it's something I'm really proud of is, you know, none of our albums ever sounded the same. And we never used the same logo twice, and we never looked the same twice. You know, we, we kind of prided ourselves on following our heart. You this know, is where we're at now. This Boom. is where this is today. Yeah. You know, if we were to record right now today, I don't know what it would sound like, but it sure wouldn't sound like three years ago, or five yeah. years ago, or eight years ago. Yeah. In order to have longevity, you've got to have some sort of change. You just can't be do, doing the same thing, and you're gonna you're gonna lose a few. You're going to gain a few, hopefully. And I, and I find that with our fans, in a lot of cases, right now people say two albums that were really underrated. One was the album we did with John Karabi and one was the one uh, Generous Swine are yeah. their favorite albums now. Yeah. Because they really wouldn't give them a shot at the time. And now they go back and they go, wow, well, these guys were like way ahead of their time. And that's just the problem with being ahead of your time. Sometimes you're so far out there that people can't catch up. <laughs>